All right, let's get started. Thank you everyone for joining us. My name is Greta with World Beyond War, and this is our first webinar in our five-week Divest from the War Machine webinar series co-hosted by Code Pink and World Beyond War. I'm the organizing director with World Beyond War, and today I'm joined by my colleague Mark Elliott Stein, who will be assisting us with a Q&A at the end of the webinar. Welcome, Mark. Thanks, welcome everybody. Today's webinar kicks off our divestment webinar series by introducing the why, what, and how of divestment. Why do we want to divest from war? What is the war machine and how do we actually divest? Our guests today are Code Pink's Divest from the War Machine campaign organizers, Carly Town and Cody Urban. Welcome, Carly and Cody. Thank you, Greta. Thanks, Greta. Really glad to be here. And World Beyond War's co-founder and executive director, David Swanson. Welcome, David. Thanks, Greta. Today, we'll talk about the strategies and tactics needed to run a divestment campaign. And David will share his success story of divesting the city of Charlottesville from both weapons and fossil fuels and his continuing work as the public representative on the city's retirement commission. This webinar is being recorded. We are also live on YouTube and we will be sharing the recording afterwards. Um, all of the participants are muted right now and you will have a chance to unmute at the end for Q&A and discussion. You can also use the chat throughout the webinar to post questions and comments. And if you're watching us live on YouTube, you can also post comments there as well, which we'll be monitoring throughout this. So let's get started. Divestment is organizing to remove public and private assets from weapons manufacturers, military contractors, and war profiteers. But before we go into how we actually divest, I wanna talk a little bit about the why. Why do we want to divest from the war machine? So I'm going to share my screen and share a quick presentation. Okay. Do you see seven reasons to divest? Yep. Okay, perfect. So World Beyond War created a series of fact sheets which talk about the seven reasons why we need to end war and why we need to divest. You can access these by going to worldbeyondwar.org slash flyers, which is the link up on your screen right now. And these are designed as online PDFs, which can be printed for use when tabling or handed to elected officials when you're doing lobby meetings. I also use these fact sheets when I'm doing interviews with the media because they really distill a lot of information into a couple of powerful short statements that can be used when talking to the media. And so, as I said, these fact sheets go through the top seven reasons of why we need to divest. And thanks to the help of numerous volunteers, we have meticulously footnoted all of these fact sheets. So you have all of the references if you want to get more information on any of these topics. So the first one that's up on your screen right now is number one, war is immoral. And this fact sheet talks about the death tolls from modern warfare. It talks about the humanitarian impact of sanctions as a tool of warfare. And it talks about the refugee crisis caused by war. So number one, we need to divest because war is immoral. Number two, war endangers us. This fact sheet talks about how violence provokes more violence, how war is counterproductive for our safety. It includes quotes from former top military officials who talk about how war is perpetuating more war. And it talks about how the arms race threatens us and puts all of us at risk for the brink, at the brink of nuclear apocalypse. Number three, we need to divest because war threatens the environment. This fact sheet talks about how war contributes to the climate crisis. It talks about the carbon footprint of war, the impact of war on our waterways and how war is a major water contaminant. It also talks about the impact of landmines. Number four, we need to divest because war erodes our civil liberties. This fact sheet talks about the militarization of the police. It also talks about how war erodes the rule of law and how, for example, since World War II, U.S. presidents have acquired uh, more and more power to operate in secrecy uh, outside of the oversight of the U.S. Congress. Number five, we need to divest because war impoverishes us. 
This fact sheet talks about the financial costs of war. It has a list of the costs of modern warfare. It also talks about the financial costs of the preparation for war beforehand and afterwards the financial costs of the damage caused by war. Number six, we need to divest because war promotes bigotry. This fact sheet talks about how war has fueled and been fueled by racism, how war and killing the other often involves dehumanizing the other person, and how war is also fueled by patriotism and nationalism and often by religious hatred that is used as a factor to promote warfare. And lastly, we need to divest from war because we need $2 trillion a year, which is the global military budget, for other things. And this fact sheet goes through a list of trade-offs and how we could use military spending, the war budget, we could divert that to so many other vital human and environmental needs. And it talks about the various uh, trade-offs that we could make. It also talks about how um, military spending and um, the war economy is actually not good for job creation and how we can create more jobs in other peacetime industries than we can in the war industry. So that is a very quick overview of our top seven reasons to end war and to divest, but I encourage you to go to our website, worldbeyondwar.org, and to click on the why, and then you can see uh, more information about all of these top seven reasons. So now that we've talked about the why, I want to transition to the how, and so I'm going to introduce Carly and Cody to share a presentation about what is actually divestment, how can we do it, and what are the types of divestment? Great. Thank you so much, Gutter, for that really great in introduction. Um, I'm going to ask Cody now to share his screen so we can start our presentation. Um, just want to make sure it's in view, full screen mode, Cody. Yeah, perfect. Awesome. Okay, great. Um, so thanks for that, Greta, again. Uh, my name is Carly Town. I'm a national organizer on the Code Pink Divest from the War Machine campaign. Um, I'm going to start by giving just a short background on the Divest from the War Machine campaign, some of our underlying principles that guide our work, and then Cody and I will review what divestment means and how you can get involved locally. Uh, slide, please, Cody. So Code Pink is a women-led grassroots organization working to end U.S. wars and militarism, support peace and human rights initiatives, and redirect our tax dollars into healthcare, education, green jobs, and other life-affirming programs. Slide. Um, and the Divest from the War Machine campaign started in October of 2017, um, where a summit in Washington, D.C. brought together foreign policy experts, researchers, veterans, um, present and former government officials and a range of divestment activists uh, to shed light on the current state of U.S. military apparatus and examine the power of divestment as a tool to educate and mobilize the public around the U.S. war machine. Slide, please. Uh, so today we're really going to delve into how we can use divestment as a tool to educate and mobilize the public. But first, just want to take a quick step back and just elaborate a little bit on what um, Greta went over earlier, and just say that it's important to understand some of the basic underlying principles that drive our campaign. Um, if you'll see on the screen, um, you know, our campaign really operates with an understanding that the US war machine is a really cyclical process, right? So if we start off first, um, we recognize that weapons manufacturers produce the arms and technology that make wars possible in the process making large profits. Um, at Code Pink, we say they literally make a killing on killing. Uh, and if we go to the next part, um, it says US weapons manufacturers use those profits to help fund the campaigns of politicians um, and place their manufacturing plants in politicians' districts. Uh, those same politicians vote to extend existing wars, engage in new conflicts, and steadily increase the Pentagon budget. And then the last part underlying this entire dynamic is the fact that large financial institutions like banks and asset managers invest heavily in these weapons manufacturers and make a large return. And in that process, weapons manufacturers are able to continue to produce the arms and technology that make wars profitable, and we could go on in this cycle forever, right? Um, so while the US war machine encompasses more than just weapons manufacturers and their financial backers, 
recognizing the role that these actors play in perpetuating the U.S. war machines presents an opportunity for everyday people to intervene. Um, like Greta said, to put very simply, divestment means removing assets we have invested in weapons manufacturers and war profiteers. So divestment is a tangible action that enables the public to confront the military industrial complex and take away the social license of major arm producers who profit from perpetuating US military both at home and abroad. Slide please. Thanks. Um, we can use divestment as a tool to achieve a variety of objectives. Um, so, you know, one of our campaign, some of our campaign objectives include sparking a vital debate, public debate, questioning the role of weapons manufacturers and military contractors in perpetuating conflict around the world, exposing how our financial and educational institutions are supporting those companies, inspiring the public and investors to um, pressure these institutions to divest, bringing together a coalition, um, of the global anti-war and peace movements, holding the arms industry accountable in political and financial spheres for its culpability in the death and displacement of millions of innocent people, and of course, condemning our government's prioritization of military spending and demanding that uh, diplomacy and aid, not just militarism, be our country's response to global conflicts. Um, so, slide please. Uh, we work to achieve these objectives um, at various levels. Um, we work to achieve them at the national level um, by educating people and holding weapons manufacturers and their institutional investors accountable. Um, so those can include uh, asset managers, banks, university endowments. Um, we educate people and work to divest from the Pentagon budget. Um, and we advocate to invest in social programs as well. Right, so we also approach this campaign from a divest invest framework. It's important to talk about once we divest, what do we actually want our society to look like? Slide, please. Um, so, for example, on tax day this year, we engage people around the country to imagine what kind of society we could have if we cut Pentagon's funding and instead invested in social programs like universal health care or education or a Green New Deal. Um, we've been advocating to cut money from the Pentagon budget since the beginning of Code Pink, but this year in particular, we've really seen how we can raise, raise people's consciousness around the fact that we have steadily siphoned so much of our budget into the Pentagon and away from vital social programs for decades, right? Um, because this is just one of the reasons why our government's response to COVID-19 has been so disastrous. So this is really a time in history when we can start to shift the narrative um, and explain that investing $740 billion in the Pentagon does not make us safer, right? In fact, as we've seen, it makes us less safe. Um, so as you can see, the work that we do at the national level also engages people in their local communities, right? You can see that on this slide. So it's important to talk about divesting from the Pentagon budget because this is an issue that affects everyone's lives. It's powerful for people to be able to imagine how their lives and communities could be improved if we divested from the Pentagon and invested in social programs. But we also work to organize people in their local communities to really drive home the fact that we can address the role that the US war machine plays where we live. Um, and so on that note, I'm gonna pass this along to Cody to explain a little bit more how we can organize in our local communities. So let me share my screen. Thank you so much, Carly. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Awesome. So yeah, like Harley was saying, um, us at the Divest from the War Machine campaign really do look at how we are organizing at the local level and how that is relating to the national campaign. The campaign is national in scope, but it's made up of so many different activists, so many different organizers throughout the country and actually, honestly, around the world doing divestment work. Um, and so we really wanna take a strong look at how this work in the local sphere impacts the whole national campaign. Uh, next slide. So some of the ways that that uh, happens is that um, local politicians we know play a role directly um, in divestment work because they can divest state and city funds from weapons manufacturers. Um, and as they do that, um, 
they add your city and your state's voices to the growing movement to cut federal military uh, spending. Um, and also by signing the campaign contributions pledge, which uh, is part of the campaign, um, both incumbent and candidate politicians can commit to being held accountable to their constituents for the actions taken in office. And this is a really important part is that when a candidate or a sitting uh, government uh, politician signs this campaign pledge, it is then a tool through which you as activists can then hold them accountable. Um, and make sure that they are um, being allies on the inside for this movement. Um, universities are also uh, complicit in weapons funding through their endowment funds. So cutting the funding from war manufacturers on a campus can sometimes even have a domino effect for the city government as well. Um, it can energize community members in the surrounding community to spread the victory uh, off of the campus as well. Um, and of course, on the personal level, um, and invest pension funds, religious institutions, um, of course, um, but we can also pers personally divest our own individual funds as well from these. So there's, from the personal level all the way to the community, to the campus, all of this plays a major part in uh, sort of the domino effect, like I said before, of contributing nationally to a campaign like this. Uh, next slide. All right. So now let's take a look at the bigger picture. Um, divestment work, uh, I think, can be one of the most concrete victories that can be made against funding of the war machine. But sometimes it can feel like just a small victory. And sometimes even that small victory on itself seems pretty daunting. Um, a divestment resolution that's passed at the city or campus level is always a victory to point to. And I really wanna drive that home. That is always a victory when we get one of those resolutions passed. Um, but it can sometimes seem minuscule next to the sheer power held by the war machine in government, in finance, in culture. Um, so let's look at the broader scope of uh, divestment campaigns on local level and how it fits into the wider picture of anti-militarism organizing. So starting at the beginning of this, um, the beginning of this uh, arrow path, once a resolution is passed, um, and we're going to talk much more about the ins and outs of how that's done at future webinars um, in this series. Uh, the objective of a divestment team changes from what, I'm, what I call resolution makers to accountability keepers. Uh, it's never enough to assume that institutions will abide by the rules of the resolution on their own. Uh, and in fact, they don't often do it. Um, but that means that there's an active, that each divestment coalition on the ground has and plays an active and vigilant effort um, that has to be exerted on behalf of the divestment team uh, with new tactics being put into place, but to achieve the same strategy, which is, of course, stopping funding for the war machine. Um, so then simultaneously to accountability keeping is the effort of using this local victory to what I call move it up the food chain, so to say. Um, so move that city resolution into a state resolution. Move that single university resolution into one taken up by the entire network that that university is a part of. Did you have dedicated allies in the local government who helped convince their colleagues? Well, those are now your allies who can be recruited to find new allies at the state and even the federal level. So in this way, it's that domino effect again that really there's always a new, something new to jump on and there's always a way to expand the victory and share in that. And then of course, while all of this is happening, divestment campaigns can and they should be seen as a tool for continuous political education. So this is an opportunity to use the process of a campaign to educate people on the deeper issues of militarism and the military industrial complex. Um, I really believe that there is no greater teacher than directly organizing and practical work. Um, so each new activist that joins your campaign, uh, they should have a direct task, something to do to work on physically so that they can experience what it feels like to work for political change. Um, but of course, there always has to be an intentional educational aspect of each campaign to help newer activists make sense of these experiences and start to become more conscious of the bigger forces that play into the US war machine. And finally, no campaign is one in a vacuum. 
the war machine impacts every aspect of society with a global reach of destruction, very much to what Greta was uh, opening us up with all the ways that it affects so many aspects of our lives around the world. Mass incarceration, police violence, white supremacy, heteropatriarchal ideologies, mass poverty and the climate crisis, all of these are byproducts of the same systemic forces that prop up the US war machine. So any divestment campaign that's targeting weapons companies is made much stronger when it's in coalition with different organizations that are taking up these issues as well. Uh, we'll be dedicating later webinars in the series to coalition building about what that'll look like. Um, but for now, I'll just say that by, widen by widening the narrative, but narrowing the target, that's the way that we can really push a shared victory because a shared victory is always a bigger victory. Uh, I think we have a lot to learn from each other in our movement building work. So it's crucial that we take every opportunity available to be in partnership on organizing a divestment campaign. And so this whole sort of structure is how we can view divestment in the bigger picture from the individual to the local to the national and even international level. Uh, next slide. So the rest of these slides are kind of uh, pictures that I'll finish with to show a bit about um, uh, how the local campaigns have been doing their work. So here are different, um, many congressional candidates have signed the divestment pledge. Uh, we have Heidi Sloan from Texas, Nabila Islam from Georgia, Doyle Canning from Oregon, that have all as part of their campaigns um, pledged to not take money from weapons uh, manufacturers like was mentioned at the local area. And of course, this is not just um, candidates. Um, here, Councilwoman Carmen Castillo from Providence uh, is a sitting member who has also taken that pledge. So this is something that both sitting and candidate uh, uh, members can sign. Next slide. Uh, and then of course, I think that the, the heart and energy at the core of any kind of divestment work and any kind of mass movement really is where youth and students are taking it up. Um, so here are some uh, images of UT Austin students, um, of Cal Poly students, of uh, UC, I don't remember which campus, but it is uh, universities and colleges across the country who are really pushing to get their um, universities and colleges to divest their endowments from the war machine um, and really using their voice as students to make sure that that is something that they can hold their campuses accountable to. Next slide. Um, and then also at the city levels, municipal levels, um, different mayors and city councils are passing resolutions. This is Heidi Harmon, the mayor of San Luis Obispo, who are slow, who signed the commit to um, divest from the war machine. And as you can see on the left here, are many different community members who were behind this uh, effort too, who also um, joined the campaign. So this is where it's a community effort um, primarily, and it's through that that people on the inside of government um, can also sign on. Next slide. Uh, no. Finally, I will finish by um, pointing at our BlackRock campaign. Um, BlackRock is the, I believe it's the world's largest asset holder ever <laughs> in the world. Um, and many of its uh, stocks that it, that it holds are in weapons manufacturers. It actually holds stocks in pretty much, if you can think of any company that is doing the worst that it could do for humanity and the planet, BlackRock has investments in it because let's be honest, that is how asset companies get rich, by making a killing off killing. Um, so we have a major campaign to get BlackRock to pull all of its investments from weapons companies. Um, and also a part of the campaign is pushing the companies and others who hold assets in BlackRock to pull from that. That includes um, universities that hold, that allow, that give their asset control to BlackRock. And many of us now have been seeing, have been uh, studying closely the stimulus package that came from the government in response to COVID. Well, who was hired to be the main financial advisor for how the stimulus package would get uh, sorted out? It was BlackRock. 
So this Divest in the War Machine campaign, especially now in COVID, I mean, all the time, but it really goes from the local all the way to the top of the war machine to the White House. Um, so though that's just a little, these slides are a bit of an example of how this all plays out in the bigger picture. And I think I'll pass it from there uh, to David, who's gonna tell us, uh, um, give us a bit more of a, some more concrete examples of what this divestment work looks like. Thank you very much, Carly and Cody. Yes, so now we're going to hear from David Swanson, co-founder of World Beyond War, to share his story of the successful campaign to divest the city of Charlottesville, Virginia from both weapons and fossil fuels. So David, I have some questions for you. Um, first, can you tell us how you went about the process of initiating this campaign in Charlottesville and forming a citywide coalition? Yeah, well, we thought we would do weapons and fossil fuels together uh, to be a broader coalition. And we thought we would uh, divest from not just weapons of war, but also weapons sold uh, for use on US streets. As Charlottesville, as some of you may have heard, had a fascist rally with people shooting guns in the streets here. Didn't need you know our public money invested in that, in guns that were being brought to our streets. And, and didn't need, you know, our teachers' retirements dependent on uh, there being more wars uh, abroad. But we also knew that fossil fuels would be easier and we could tie them together. Um, it, it, people can actually see the, the steps we went through and the petition and the wording and the, and the video of what we said to the city council and all of that at worldbeyondwar.org slash divest Seville divest C V I L L E. Um, but we, we didn't think we would make it all about uh, the Pentagon and the US war machine. Uh, we thought that one of the advantages of going after weapons as opposed to wars or the military is precisely that US weapons are sold to dozens of brutal dictatorships and oppressive governments around the world for everybody's wars and that most wars have US made weapons on both sides. And so we, we came up with those sorts of arguments and we, we did a little bit of research. We, you know, found out that our city had divested before, you know, had divested from Sudan and South Africa and so forth, even if it didn't own anything to actually divest at that point in time, it had passed that, uh, that decision to divest uh, and could therefore couldn't use the argument now that it, you know, that it wouldn't be able to. So we were prepared for all the usual pushback against anything, you know, ethical or national or global. But we were also ready to say, you've done this exact thing uh, before uh, and you can do it again. Um, and, uh, and so we also had passed through this same city resolutions directed at Congress, like divest your money, move money from the military to human and environmental needs. So we could say, which is an easier thing to do, because it's not the city actually doing anything, it's telling the Congress what to do. But we could then say to the city, this is your expressed public position, you've been telling Congress what to do, and yet you've got your own money invested, you know, so we we figured out these kind of arguments and we looked for candidates running for office in our city who would take the position because it's easier to get a candidate than an incumbent to do anything right but if the candidates are all saying they'll do it then the incumbents know that they've got to do it um and in fact there was a candidate uh for charlottesville city council pushing divestment from fossil fuels uh, before I ever lifted a finger. Uh, so we got him and several other candidates on board with fossil fuels and weapons divestment. Uh, and we did the research to find out that in fact there was, there were weapons investments and fossil fuel investments to be uh, divested. Uh, so we got prominent people, we got groups and organizations, and by having two issues, we could get more groups and organizations and, and join them together. And in this case, the campaign target was the city council. Is that correct? Uh, it, it was, that was part of the target. Uh, you know, we, you have to find out both uh, what your local government is doing and what your local government has any power over. 
uh, many localities in Virginia, you know, have investments controlled by the state government, uh, which famously denies local governments the power to do almost anything. But uh, Charlottesville uh, had the power to divest its operating budget and its retirement fund uh, from whatever it wanted to divest from. But it's technically the city treasurer who has that power here. And so the city treasurer is unlikely to go against uh, the city council, but the reverse was probably also true. So we had to win over both uh, the city treasurer, who's an elected official, usually it's not even a contested election, and uh, the city council. So we, we, did, we used all the online tools. We set up a, a petition and a website and made videos. Uh, we planned events, we bought ads, we wrote op-eds, we did media interviews, we did little press conferences in front of City Hall for the local TV stations. We, we drafted the wording we wanted um, and we went to a city council meeting and packed it and got as many people signed up as we could to speak at the beginning of the meeting. Had to, you know, who's going to speak on what topic or the whole coalition making an impressive showing. The last person tells everybody in the room to stand up if they agree, they all stand up. We get it on the agenda for the next meeting, uh, you know, and then they rewrite it and it's not as good, but we come back and do the same thing the next meeting and get it passed. Uh, it took, uh, maybe it took us two or three meetings, uh, but, uh, you know, that's the basic routine that we went through. And the videos are at worldbeyondwar.org slash divest bill. And so then you were able to successfully divest the operating budget, but then what, what, what was the remaining step and what is that follow-up that you're working on now, David? Yeah, so the, the operating budget, uh, very quickly, the city treasurer followed through and did what, you know, essentially we had gotten him to draft for the city council, uh, and, and he did what they recommended to him uh, and took money out of any fossil fuel company or weapons company. But then the retirement fund was going to be a trickier issue because it's overseen by this retirement commission uh, and it has to be responsible to the retirees, uh, including it has to maximize money for the retirees. Uh, and, uh, and so that was going to take a while and they were in the process of hiring a financial consultant. And so we had to make a compromise and say, we'll take half a victory. Headline's going to be the same anyway. The educational process is going to continue and be energized anyway. We'll take half a victory with the operating budget. Uh, you know, so you have to have a little faith that they're not just lying to you and coming up with excuses, that they really are willing to divest this one budget and can't do the other one as easily. And, and then we had to pursue the retirement fund. And that involved, among other things, me getting on the retirement commission as a member of it and going to meetings. So... So the most important skill, I think, is patience and uh, tolerance for boredom. But, the, but the, the other things you have to figure out is specifically how to do the divestment. Um, you know, because we, we set up a subcommittee of the Retirement Commission, and we had all these consultants, you know, the, the ethical and socially responsible investment expert from Wells Fargo, if you can believe there is such a thing, and, and from all these other banks and investment firms and consultants, and they would all come in and tell us all the whole history and pros and cons of, you know, of ethical investment and divestment and so forth. And it's, you know, and it's just such a barrage of diversion and obfuscation and they'll come in and they'll tell you, oh, you could just divest from the biggest weapons companies, but really you could do more. You could divest from any military contractor that makes any little part of any weapon, but it would be so complicated. You'd never be able to do it. Yeah. Okay. We didn't want to do it. You know, stop, stop telling us about it. Or, you know, you could, uh, you could uh, invest in, uh, you know, you could, you could do really ethical investment only in the best rated companies. But by the way, the ratings never agree with each other, these different rating systems, and they're all corrupt and all nonsense, and you, they're completely hidden from you, how they calculate it, and you have no control over it, and you don't really want to do that. Yeah, okay, we didn't want to do that. You know, or, you know, they, and, and they'll admit, all of these experts will admit that 90% of the time, uh, ethical investment 
schemes uh, have either broken even or made more money. Uh, but then when you say to them, okay, well then let's do it, they say, oh, no, no, but we can't predict the future. This is only about the past. I mean, <laughs> this is, you know, you're dealing with an institution that's gambling on Wall Street. That's what it does, right? And you're saying, do it a little less immorally. And they say, oh, well, we can't predict the future. Well, you can't predict the future about the immoral investments anymore. So it's all this, you know, it's all these blind alleys and you have to just go to meeting after meeting and stop them and say, here's what we want to do. We want to take this authoritative list that's updated annually of the top 100 weapons dealers in the world and this other one of the top 100 uh, fossil fuel producers, not consumers, not anything else you want to drag in, and we want to divest from those things because we would rather do something than do nothing or listen to you guys for six more months. You know, uh, so, you have, so you have to figure out those details. Um, and, and you have to figure out how to talk to people who don't want to hear about morality and want to hear about profits and explain to them both that this does something good and that it does not risk a penny being lost and is potentially profitable. Uh, you know, and, and of course, these meetings were canceled. There is no more retirement commission. There's, there's coronavirus emergency. Uh, and there were reports coming out, that, you know, several months back before this emergency pandemic happened that were looking, re that were really very helpful about fossil fuels not being profitable, about weapons not being profitable. And so it, now it matters what happens in this coronavirus capitalism that's going on, where, you know, Boeing is just getting billions dumped on it. Uh, you know, oil's become worthless, but essential to invest in and bail out. You know, so it really, really matters uh, what Congress does so that when these meetings resume and I go back and try to tell them, you know, weapons and fossil fuels are not the most profitable, they can't say, oh yeah, they just got a trillion dollars from the US government. That, you know, it, we, we have to, you know, we have to take every possible angle we can to make these things unprofitable or we can't get these institutions to divest from them. Thank you so much, David, for sharing your success story. Um, now, can you launch the poll? And then after the poll, we'll go into Q&A. So there should be a poll on your screens and you can let us know how you want to get involved with divestment in your community. All right. Thanks for voting. It's a tight race between all of the options. I see some votes are still coming in. I think the people voting can't see the results, so we have to end the poll and then display the results or something. Yeah, why don't you end it and share the results? Okay, perfect. Yeah, thanks for letting us know. And so after this webinar, we'll be sharing the link to the recording and we'll also share some more resources and ways that you can get involved with our campaigns. So we'll be in touch. Um, but now we want to open up to Q&A and discussion. So if you're uh, watching on the YouTube live stream, you can type in your questions and comments in the chat. Um, if you're here on Zoom, you can also type in questions and comments in the chat box on Zoom. Um, if you're joining us via phone dial-in, you can press star nine, that's star nine, to raise your hand on the phone. And if you're on Zoom, you can also click on participants and then click the raise hand feature. So there's a number of ways that you can let us know your questions. Mark, do we have any questions coming in? Uh, yes, we do. Let's start. Um, this is from right here in Zoom, and this is from G.D. Um 
The national network opposing the militarization of youth is extending this divestment beyond how we support the vast and socially debilitating war industry with our dollars to include the idea of divesting of our bodies. That means intervening against military recruitment inside our public schools and against esports and militarized gaming. Well, that's really a few different topics. Why don't we start with military recruitment in schools? Um, and maybe we could go in the same order that we spoke in. Um, do, does divestment, does this campaign um, or these type of campaigns extend into these areas, Carly? Yeah, thank you so much for that question. It's, it's a really good one. Um, you know, I think something that we've emphasized from the top is that divestment is a tool that we can use to educate people about the various ways that the war machine um, is really part of our everyday lives in a way that a lot of people can't see. Um, so part of that education is really, um, you know, clarifying for people how the war machine affects their daily lives. And I think talking about um, the ways in which uh, military recruitment targets um, particular people in our society, right, working class people, uh, people of color, um, and, and really uses um, economic crises um, to recruit them to um, commit violence abroad is, is really important. And I think it's a way that students, um, before they get to college, can really start doing this work as well. Um, I just, I remember seeing um, from a military um, news outlet that they were celebrating the fact that the student uh, debt crisis was so bad because it was helping with their military recruitment um, so, you know, I think all of these things are connected and we, it's really important that we, we make those connections. Yep. Cody, anything to add? Not really. I would echo everything Carly to say. I, I really appreciate the way that the question was posed um, as it's between divesting our money and literally divesting our bodies. Um, mm -hmm. Like when we're talking about youth and pe people actually like physically saying, no, I am not going to go in the military. I think that um, the, also the part that Carly mentioned about economic crises being a way that not just how corporations uh, swallow up more money um, and capital, but a way that the military swallows up more actual people, actual bodies of people to wage its, uh, its wars. Um, so I think that I agree this is definitely a, a major combination and goes back to that coalition building that I was talking about in my part of the slideshow, which I think that any kind of work that is looking to um, get rid of the um, of sort of the root causes of the profits and the root causes of the machinery of war um, is work that should be done in, in tandem with each other. Um, definitely. Um, and specifically about counter recruitment, that is one of the um, one of our main activities at World Beyond War. Maybe David, you just want to say a little bit about counter recruitment in general and how we approached that. Well, I don't know if it's one of our main activities. Though I guess we have a lot of them. We do have a good website at do not enlist dot com uh, that you might want to share with anyone who is considering enlisting. Uh, but I think you know the, this counter recruitment angle and calling it divestment uh, has a lot in common with uh, with what these divestment campaigns, like the one I was talking about, do because part of this is about defunding the, the money. Part of it is about educating people uh, as to what's going on. Uh, and a lot of it is about creating shame, creating a culture in which it's not praiseworthy or a neutral act, but a shameful act to be investing in instruments of mass murder. Uh, and so, you know, we, when we're asking for major weapons companies to be divested from, nobody has a clue, uh, apart from, you know, people like us, nobody has a clue what the major weapons companies are. And if you say the word Boeing, you get all these screams, oh, but Boeing makes airplanes. I've heard of them. You, do you want to, you want to divest from a company that also makes airplanes? <laughs> you know, and so you, you have to, you, you have to get to a point where it's not acceptable to make airplanes that fly passengers as in, and on the side make airplanes that bomb families. It's shameful. It's so shameful to make 
airplanes that bomb families that nobody cares about your, your other airplanes. So it's, it's this process of, of creating some shame in war profiteering and death profiteering, uh, you know, that existed in this, in this country a hundred years ago, but has gradually been uh, taken away, you know, and so this is, this is why we combined weapons with fossil fuels, because there's this growing shame about profiting from fossil fuels. And we want, we want to piggyback on that with the weapons as well, as well as create the educational opportunity to explain to people why they're not separate issues, why war and, and fossil fuels are, are the same. By, by the way, if you go to worldbeyondwar.org right now, the top article is a, is a letter that I wrote today to a, to a basketball player here at the University of Virginia who is looking into getting into a career in counterterrorism. Uh, and I'm trying to talk him out of it. So every, every counter recruitment <laughs> argument I could think of is in there. Nice. Okay. Um, this one I think might be a quick one. Clara, Clara is asking, how do we notify you of the events that um, any of us hold? So that would, we would be both Code Pink and World Beyond War. Um, Greta, do you want to mention quickly how they do that with us? Yeah, I'll just speak from World Beyond War's perspective. So if you go to our website, worldbeyondwar.org, and then just click on the word events, it will bring you to our global events map. And we encourage you to post any and all peace events and anti-war events to that map so that you can share them and we can help promote them. And how about Code Pink? Yeah, good question. You can always email us at divest at codepink.org, and we're happy to help you promote your events. So I'll put the email in the chat box. Okay. Chuck Johnson is asking, um, are we coordinating with Don't Bank on the Bomb, which is encouraging divestment from nuclear weapons? Um, who wants to answer that? I can answer it. Um, yes, the answer is yes. In fact, if you join us on our um, webinar that's coming up next Wednesday, Susie Snyder from Don't Bank on the Bomb will be joining us to talk about how to actually delve into and do research for divest campaigns. So very much collaborating with them. Great. Um, we've got a lot of questions. Here's one from our friend David Hartso. Um, could you tell us more success stories of successful divestment from the war machine for universities, cities, and religious institutions? Actually, I just want to quickly go first. I was involved with some of the Code Pink protests at Black Rock. And I know that we did get a reaction from the boardroom in terms of press releases, at least. They certainly were playing defense. Um, whether there was substantial change, I, I think the jury's still out. But we definitely did see that we got a reaction um, from BlackRock. Um, but beyond, I, I'd love to hear other success stories from all of you. Um. I can answer a couple of those um, just to kind of piggyback on what you were saying, Mark. Um, yeah, and, and recently, you know, Code Pink was part of um, a sign on letter to demand that BlackRock um, is more transparent in the um, bailout um, initiatives that they're taking on. And, and recently, the uh, federal government has said that they're going to release the companies that will be receiving the bailout funds um, from BlackRock, which is, you know, transparency is, is a win in a divest campaign, right? Um, so that's great. Um, I did want to mention, yeah, we have other cities who we've worked with to help divest. Um, Berkeley, California, Santa Monica, California, West Hollywood, California. Um, Santa Monica and West Hollywood are really great because they surround and are contiguous with Los Angeles. Um, so they're smaller, um, easier victories to get. And then now we're working to divest Los Angeles, actually, um, from the war machine. So that's great. Um, I want to also open it up to other people that want to take over. Well, I would just add that if you if you look at localities that, that are just divesting from nuclear weapons, then you get a much longer list of victories mm -hmm. or just divesting from Israeli uh, weapons and, and companies you get or, or fossil fuels, uh, of course, you get a much longer list of victories, whole countries like Ireland, you know, and so uh, if, if you take all of those examples and say, look, here, here's this trend, uh, you know, the, the, our, our locality would not be the first. We're playing catch up here. This has been done. You know, mm -hmm. places, backward places like Charlottesville have done this. You know, then, you know, then you say, here's, the, here's what we want to divest from. We want to divest from 
this list of things, which includes all weapons, not just a particular type of weapon. Uh, you know, you have a, this is gonna, the point of doing this is, is to get lots of places to do it, to have an impact. But the more places we get to do it, the easier it ought to be to get more of them because we can point to all the ones that already have. And I would just point folks to look at the chat. We're getting a lot of folks putting in other victories that they're um, talking about. Evanston, Illinois, divesting from nuclear weapons, Cambridge divesting from nuclear weapons. So yeah, uh, I think that another thing that comes to mind for me is that there's been all these victories that were mentioned um, about the, specifically from the divest from the war machine campaign that we did see like where that campaign itself was instrumental in making these victories. Um, but I think also like it, the campaign itself takes so much inspiration from so many divestment vic uh, victories over, I mean, over a hundred years um, that really um, have been not just chipping away at the, the foundations of the war machine as it's grown, but have mobilized so many people uh, around the country and world to be doing this work. And I think that whenever we um, expand our coalition work into uniting with these movements, um, the objectives become even more and more clearly met, which is exciting. Yeah, I also wanted to add, I, I put the website for the coalition in the chat box, which is divestfromwarmachine.org. And if you go to divestfromwarmachine.org slash victories, then you can read a list of even more victories that we haven't mentioned here. Great. Um, so we have more questions. I also just want to um, mentioned that somebody, somebody pointed out that divestment generates discussion of divestment and I have really experienced that and that's a success story too, that by showing up at a divestment action or by doing any activity related to it, you are informing people you know about it and you know, I think that's always a success. So it's definitely an activity that um, breeds success, I think. Uh, and now I'd like to go to YouTube. This is um, a question from Chance Shrewsbury. What do you think the best way is to network groups in an umbrella effort? Great mm. question, something we ask a lot. Who wants to start with that? Well, I think it's very important to, to have coalitions that are uncomfortably large uh, that involve people who agree on that particular issue. I mean, when we passed uh, an anti-drone uh, measure here in Charlottesville, you know, we had the peaceniks and the people with the NRA hats and everybody side by side, the people who cared about faraway wars and the people who didn't want to be spied on and loved every war they'd ever heard of, you know. It joined, uh, joining together uh, because they agreed on this one thing. Uh, and, uh, you know, the way you do it, well, you avoid unnecessary topics that people disagree on if they aren't related. You avoid uh, individuals, you know, you don't, you don't have a, a movement named for some party leader or candidate or, or individual because then you got to deal with everything that individual's ever done that somebody disagrees with. You, you have a, a campaign built around principles and policy goals uh, and you include people and groups that want to work on those policy goals and you do it uh, respectfully and and with limits you don't include any anyone or anything that's going to be so disruptive it's it's a net loss but uh, you know you 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 build what you what you can and you get that uh, that thing done great okay well, uh, can I just add on really quickly I just wanted to say I think everything that David said makes a lot of sense and so I think that really speaks to the importance of the research phase of your campaign, right? Understanding also what maybe other um, investments your city or your institution has. So you can do that outreach to um, coalition, potential coalition partners who, and, you know, really make the ask and, and clarify how um, this divestment campaign is, can also be part of their work. Um, so yeah, next week we're going to be going over that, how to do divestment research. And the last, um, webinar in our series is going to be about coalition building. So it's a really good question to ask. Great, okay. I'm, I'm skipping around a little because this one is sort of thematically related um, from Farzad. Any ideas how we can pull groups like DSA, that's Democratic Socialists of America, um, I think allied with the Bernie Sanders campaign, to get more involved with anti-war work? 
Who wants that hot question? You want to, somebody else want to go first on this one? <laughs> um, I would just say I've heard that some DSA groups do have anti-war subgroups and subcommittees. I guess it depends on your local DSA group. Um, but I think that there is that interest from DSA from what I've heard. So that's there to exploit. And overall, this is related to the last question about coalition building. I think that we have a real opportunity with anti-war organizing, because as we were talking about in the beginning with those seven reasons to divest, war connects to every other issue that anyone is ever concerned about. And so I think you can use those cross connections to your advantage to connect with any group, whether it's DSA or something else. Great. And, and we also just, just heard from Olivia Cotby Smith to say DSA member here, we have an anti-imperialist working group. Excellent. Um, and by the way, if anybody would like to speak up and ask a question yourself, you can raise your hand. Um, but we do have several good questions here. So I'm going to keep going through them. Um, Let's see. One person is asking, oh, Olivia again is asking for a future webinar to give an overview of how pension funds work in general. So there will be four more webinars in this series. Do you want to tell us what, is that something that will be coming up in, in this series? Um, sure, I can take that. So first off, I just wanted to say, and I think someone mentioned in the chat that DSA as a national body has an anti-imperialist working group. So there's someone to work, uh, reach out to, and they can also get you connected with local chapters in your area. They've, in my experience, been good coalition partners. Um, so just that right off the bat. And then we don't have a, a, a webinar addressing specifically pension funds, but our next webinar um, is talking about how to do research for divestment campaigns um, at different levels. Um, so that would be one to come to if you're interested in that. Um, the following webinar is about how to, um, organized during the time of COVID-19. So how can we speak back to some of the divestment um, myths that a lot of people in particular now will be talking about, right? Like, oh, it's, it's not financially prudent to divest, et cetera. Um, we're all, we also have an, a, um, a webinar about coalition building and I'm missing one. We'll have one on university divestment. University divestment. Great. Maybe if I could just add, Mark, uh, I, I think Greta is right that war connects to every issue, but it's, it's not just a particular war so much as the institution of war and the investment in war that connects to every other issue. And if you go to worldbeyondwar.org and look at the menu at the top, it says, why? Why end war? Why abolish the institution of war? And you go down to environment and economics and racism and so forth, there are the connections to be made. And so how do we get other groups involved that aren't focused on war? I, I think it's two parts. I think one is we show them we've got numbers, we've got strength, we've got power, we've got something to offer in coalition. And number two, it's making the arguments that they may or may not have heard. And uh, if you look at worldbeyondwar.org slash Bernie, you'll see uh, uh, a petition that we did four years ago to push Bernie Sanders uh, to have a much better position on war and foreign policy and budget. And it worked, he did, it, he didn't become perfect, but he had a much better foreign policy the second time around than the first time uh, because of, and, and I, I went with uh, Code Pink people, as a matter of fact, we went together to a meeting with his staff to, to discuss that petition. But, uh, you know, make those are the kind of arguments that we made to him. I think they would apply to, to people like DSA as well. So uh, look at that slash Bernie page. Yeah, and I think the, the last thing I'll say on this, on this question of how do we bring more people in to do the work with us, I think is posed more as the question of, how do we link with folks on the ground already doing this work too? Because one thing I see, at least in my organizing, is there's so many organizations, there's so many communities who are doing anti-militarism work, who are doing divestment work, uh, who are doing anti-police brutality work, and are just simply made invisible by the mainstream, um, and oftentimes actually invisible by like even mainstream organizing. So I think a way, and obviously I hope that this will come uh, more in our coalition building webinar when we finish off this series. Um, but I think that, you know, finding the connections that like, like David is saying, finding ways to really bring those links and show people why uh, war is what it is, is also seeing how can we really work with people on the ground 
um, and really learn to speak the language that they are speaking with their communities about war, about militarism, about poverty, about the climate crisis. So like, for example, I know that like the BDS movement that Palestinian communities and have been pushing for so many years um, is a massive um, movement that the divest, the different divest coalitions um, could and should unite with, especially that it's a movement that's so under attack. Um, different um, Puerto Rican student organizations who are pushing back against their campuses who are holding assets that hold um, Puerto Rican debt. Well, that Puerto Rican debt that, um, that financial institutions hold is also being used to fund war. So I think it really coming, comes down to us as divestment activists seeing and learning to, um, and listening, seeing, learning, and listening from other movements who have been doing this work for a long time, some of times in obscurity from the mass, uh, in the mainstream picture. Thanks, Cody. So I noticed we are out of time, but I think we can stay on for maybe five more minutes because we do have a lot of questions. Um, so I did see a hand raise. Now I see it gone. Uh, so Mark, why don't you continue with the chat questions? Okay, great. Um, well, a couple of the questions were related specifically to um, colleges, and I think maybe we can put those off. Hopefully the people asking those questions will show up for the webinar about colleges, but they related to community colleges. How do you know um, wh which academics to speak to? So hopefully we can bring those up. Um, two people, Cheryl Stevenson and, um, and another person is asking about basically the percentage of um, city states that are currently divest, that are currently spending or investing in military. How big is this? How significant is this? And also, um, I'm missing the person's name, but, um, oh, John Conway, um, can that be compared and contrasted with the amount spent on healthcare and medical? So, um, can anybody speak to that? Um, I can speak to it quickly. Um, I don't have like a, an overarching, um, I don't have uh, specifically what every city and state is invested in. So that is why we're doing the research uh, webinar next to, to talk people through how they can look up what their city or institution is invested in, because that is part of the campaign. Um, but the second question, I would just say that um, Code Pink and our coalition partners have been doing that work to compare how much we're spending um, on the Pentagon to say um, healthcare expenditures um, because in this moment, of course, it's particularly salient. salient. So um, I can make sure people get that information um, after the webinar. Cool. Um, and, and any thoughts on the comparison between military spending and healthcare? I mean, I think that has been mentioned already, but as a way to, um, to message this, as a way to make people understand yeah, and the, the response to the earlier question, I can't say at all, but I suspect it's a huge number of cities and states and more, you're more likely to find investments in weapons and fossil fuels and other horrible things than not. Uh, it's, it's the norm. Uh, and, uh, and I think this is a, a wonderful moment for pointing out to people uh, what, it, what actual defensive uh, operations would be as opposed to, you know, the, defense as a, you know, as a false term for uh, mass killing and, and aggressiveness. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the, the Prime Minister of, of Norway the other day said, oh, we, we were taken by surprise by this pandemic, so we must buy more weapons and build a bigger military. Uh, which, in saying which, she missed two key points. One, the governments were all telling each other about this back in November, so it wasn't a surprise. And two, we would have been far, far better prepared uh, if all the money weren't dumped into the military that's dumped into it already. Um, and uh, I, I think it was ICANN that made a nice graphic of, you know, how many doctors and nurses and ventilators and beds in intensive care you could get uh, for the money that goes to nuclear weapons. And I recalculated and made one uh, that you can find on World Beyond Wars website slash graphics, uh, 
how much, you know, how many millions and millions of doctors and nurses and beds you could get for what's dumped into all militarism. It's, it's absolutely uh, insane. And there is no question which actually makes us safe and which endangers us. Thanks, David. Yeah, I put the link to that graphic uh, in the chat and I see Kelsey also added another graphic. So there's definitely a lot of resources out there right now making the connections to what could we do if we actually diverted military spending to other needs. Um, so we're going to wrap up now. We are out of time, but thank you so much everyone for joining us on today's webinar. And this was just the first of five webinars in our Divest from the War Machine webinar series by Code Pink and World Beyond Warp. The next webinar is Wednesday, April 29 at 4 p.m. Eastern time. And the second webinar in this series will be talking about divestment research, as Carly said. So we'll be addressing your questions about how to plan a campaign, how to do the research that's necessary, how to do power mapping and base building and kind of debunking all of those campaign terms that you might have heard about. Um, and as Carly mentioned, we'll also be joined by Susie Snyder from Don't Bank on the Bomb for this research webinar next week, Wednesday, April 29th. And we will send an email out tomorrow uh, with the link to this webinar so you can share it with your networks and we'll send you the link for joining us next week and in the future weeks. So thank you so much and have a good day.